Last week, I started a series. It's a series uh, that simply we're calling Hey Joe, Nice Coat. Uh, and it's the story of Joseph, the Old Testament story of Joseph and, and who he is. And, and last week, we kind of did the big picture. This is, this is Joseph and the whole story and the big picture, and I don't have time to, to walk you through that. So hopefully, most of you remember you know, the big picture of Joseph and who he is, uh, how he got the coat, and he was sold into slavery, all that kind of stuff. The big truth from last week that we answered was this. Why do bad things happen to good people? It was an interesting journey to talk about that. Why why do bad things happen to good people in this life, in this world? And if you're needing that, then podcast the the message from last week and and catch up and and finding the big picture answer to that. This week, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of get in the details, catch a glimpse of what God is doing in us uh, during tough times during struggles. Uh, so let me ask this question from the get-go. How many of you, and we're going to actually do our hands because we've got a little charismatic here for you, uh, how many of you have ever gone through a struggle or a trial in your life? Show me your hand. Sweet. Perfect. Those of you that have not, and then the person you're living with, I'm pretty sure they've got both hands up. I live with them. This is, you just don't understand, Jim. Um, yes, we all have, haven't we? We have all gone through struggles, trials. You know, a trial is something that happens for a short while, you know, a little thing. A tribulation is something that goes on and on and on. So we've all had troubles, trials, tribulations, struggles. And so to me, this part of the story of Joseph relates. It relates to me personally in my own journey because it, it dives in and gives me a glimpse of what God is doing. And that's important. What God is doing in me, in my life, when tough times are going on, when I'm facing a trial or or a tribulation or a struggle. And so we're going to do two things. We're kind of going to be in two places this morning answering that question. The first place we're going to be is Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 39. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there, put your finger or your marker or, or borrow something from your neighbor and, and put it Genesis 39, or your Bible app, just put a little marker on it as a favorite. But I also want you to go to Romans, Romans chapter 5. And this is a little bit unique this morning because we're going to do two parallel talks. We're going to be talking about the story of Joseph in Genesis, but I'm going to unpack a section of, of Scripture in Romans 5 that so relates to this journey uh, that we have with God and struggle and, and trial and in tribulation. Uh, and in fact, I'll go ahead and tell you, that Roman passage, uh, it is not one that I enjoy. Now, that may shock you to hear pastors say that, Jim, you're, you're not supposed to say that you don't like things in the Bible. Well, I don't. There, there's some things that I, that I read in the scripture, and when I read it, I go, man, I, I really don't like that the Bible said that. Because especially this Roman passage, it's hard truth. It's, it's really hard to kind of go, yeah, I just love that that's how it works, and that's how God works. And so this Roman passage is one of those for me where I read it, and I understand it, and I get it, and I embrace it, but it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough journey. So I'm going to read you Romans chapter 5. It's going to be verse 2 and a half to, to 5, kind of give you the perspective of what Romans says, and then we'll dive into the story of Joseph and how Romans relates. So um, let me pray for us super quick, and then we'll dive into the scripture. Father, we're about to just jump in. Jump into your word, jump into what you have to say for us, and I ask right now that you prepare our hearts, that we as your people, even those in the room that may not even be Christ followers that are just checking things out, Father, that we stop and we open our hearts to you, that Holy Spirit, that uh, you just pour yourself into us and, and let us know what it is that you have to say and how we can do this life together. So Father, first and foremost, you speak to all of us this morning. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Romans 5, verse 2b. Here we go. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That's the gospel. That's the salvation. We rejoice, first of all, because Jesus loves us and he cares for us and he has given us new life in a relationship with him when we surrender. And so Paul starts out with an easy one. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And all the Christians in the house said, "Woo, yeah, we do. I love that part. Good stuff, Paul. But then he says this, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. This is where I get a little uncomfortable. 
Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope, and, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Suffering, we are to rejoice in it. In fact, the scripture, I underlined it right here, rejoice in our suffering. When I read that, I got to tell you, that's not what I wanted it to say. What I wanted Paul to say after, hey, be excited that you're a Christ follower and God has done a work in your life. Here's what I wanted Paul to say. And every time you face a struggle, every time you have a bad day or, or things go on around you, that you just step up and you say, God, deliver me. And there's this theme song music that plays and Jesus comes in on a cape and just saves the day, catches you and goes, man, I, just, I got you and just, and just whisks us away. I, I wish that's what it said in Romans because that's what I would like for life to work like. I mean, that's what I want. I want God to step in every time I struggle and to save the day. That's, that's what I want it to say. That, that I don't have to push through and plow through tough circumstances and, and, and relationships and marriage or relationships at work or, or, or just the things that happen in life. I don't want to have to push through them yet. If you read the whole Bible, and some of you have, you won't find that verse anywhere. God is, is a God that loves us and cares about us, but, but here is a, is a deep truth. Our comfort is not God's top priority. I just let that one settle for you because that's not one you're going to find on a t-shirt or a bumper sticker on a car. Most people honk if you know God's not trying to make you comfortable. You just won't see that. But what does that truth mean? It simply means this. It doesn't mean that, that God isn't good because God is good. And God loves us and God wants good things for us and he pours out his blessings on us. As much as you have gone through struggles in life, I'm sure every one of you can say, hey, listen, I can list the blessings too. The blessings here and the blessings there and what God has done. So God's heart is good and he wants good things for us, but he also de desires something so much deeper to grow in us. He's looking for more than Christian, comfortable couch potatoes. He's, he's not looking for that in us. God is someone that's looking for his people to grow them deeper. He's like that, that trainer at the gym for some of you, and I can see who you are, that go work out, and that trainer that totally steps up and says, oh, you can do this, and they're encouraging you. But what do they also do? They push you. One more rep, one more rep. Now, for some, that illustration does not connect at all. So let me give you this one. Coaches or teachers that, that totally step up and say, hey, you, you can do this. I see this in you as a teacher. I see this in you as a coach. But they push us also to become who they know we can be. And that's the way it is with God here, that God, uh, he encourages us in this journey, but he also pushes us to become something more. And so in that, he laid out this truth, rejoice in your sufferings, because something deep is going on in your heart and your life in the journey with God. We're going to take this morning to unpack what that is, but let's go back to that Romans part because I, I want to take a look at some of those scriptures. Rejoice in suffering. You know what that literally says uh, in, the, in the Greek? It literally says this, to boast in your sufferings. Now, I don't know about you, but when it comes to boasting, I only boast around a victory. It's not often that I lose or my NCAA bracket crashes or, or anything like that, and I go, woo, look at me. I'm so great and awesome. I don't, I, you know, I don't do that when I fail. I don't do that when I struggle. I, I, I don't boast in, in those ways because boasting to me, and I think to most of us, is about victory. So when I read the scripture that says, boast in your suffering, I, I struggle and my gut reaction is why, God, why in the world should I boast in my sufferings? Because my sufferings and my struggles and my hardships that I face, you know what? They don't feel like victory. It's, it's like I'm getting beat up. This is Rocky II and I'm not winning and I'm struggling. I, I don't know how I can boast. Well, understand this as a Christ follower. Here is the victory for us in the struggle and why God lays this out saying, hey, listen, you need to rejoice in your suffering because the victory is this is that even in our trials, God is at work. In those hard moments, in those dark moments, in, the, in those moments when we're wrestling and we're struggling with truth or we're struggling with a promise that God has give us, given us that's not fulfilled, even in the wrestle, God is at work shaping our souls. 
I love Isaiah 64, 8, which simply talks about God being the potter. And, and the potter, and, and we're the clay, and, and we're the work of his hands. So the picture is God with this big old lump of clay, and he's shaping, and he's molding. And I can imagine if that clay had feelings, and it was sitting there, it was so happy just to sit there on the spinning wheel going round and round and round. But as he's going around, the, the fingers start to carve and to shape. Oh, that, that's, not, that's not looking like beauty, and, and the potter carves that piece of clay off. The, the, the clay probably goes, ow. That doesn't feel good. Why'd you cut that piece out? Well, because that, that piece isn't, isn't a part of who you really need to be. And the image is God as potter and us as clay shaping us, using the circumstances of life to do deep things in our souls. And I think that is a valuable truth for us as Christians, that God, through the circumstances that are hard and tough in our life, he does really deep things in our soul. There's a pastor, uh, he lived a, a while back, his, his name was uh, Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, and he captured it this way. He said this, those who dive into the sea of affliction, the sea of trials, the sea of sufferings, those are the ones that bring up the rarest pearls. Have you ever experienced that in your own life when, when you have been in a, 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 what felt like a sea of affliction or struggle, but you've leaned into God, and, and at the very bottom of that ocean, when it felt like the pressure was going to crush you, God gave you something, something deep about who you are and your character and your nature. That's, that's what God does and how he works in us and develops us. Success doesn't shape us. I'd, I'd love it. I would love it. The way we are shaped in this world is by success. Then we can just say, okay, God, make me successful and shape me through success. It doesn't work that way. Success reveals who we are. You, you can see these people that are wildly successful and you see a lot about their character. Success doesn't shape us. It just reveals what shapes us are the struggles and the failures in life that we have to go through, those things that, that we lean into and God simply has to work in. So that's kind of the foundation of what we're going to build on because it totally relates to Joseph's story. Here we have uh, the story of Joseph and, and who he is. And it all started for Joseph uh, when his brothers got jealous. His brothers were jealous of him and uh, they sold him into slavery and then things got even worse. Here's Joseph, he's, he's in slavery and, and things aren't going well. And then someone steps up and accuses Joseph of doing something wrong. And so Joseph goes from slavery to prison. And here's his story. This is back in Genesis chapter 39. I'm going to just give you a little bit of this so you can understand that Joseph was in the same place, working through suffering and trials in his life. This is uh, Genesis chapter 39, verse 6. I'm going to read a good chunk here, so travel along with me. So uh, Potiphar, the one who owned Joseph, it was his master, he left Joseph in charge. Joseph was really good at stuff, and so he left Joseph in charge of his whole household while he went away. So Potiphar left Joseph in charge of everything he had. And with Joseph in charge, Potiphar did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. The only thing Potiphar worried about was what was going to be on the table. Now Joseph was well-built and a handsome guy. Uh, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, Joseph said, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house and everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. There is no one greater than me in this house except my master. But, but Potiphar's wife didn't stop there. She kept pressing and pressing and pressing. And Joseph refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. And then one day, one day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants were inside and she caught him by his coat and said, come to bed with me. But he left his coat in her hand and ran out of the house. This is the second time a coat is gonna get Joseph in trouble. And when he saw that he had left his, his coat in her hand and he ran out of the house and now she's just going, I, I've got something here now. She called to her household her servants and said, look, this Hebrew he has brought in to us is to make sport of us. And he came in here to sleep with me. She's totally lying. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when I screamed, he ran. And he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. And she kept the cloak beside her until Potiphar, the master, came home. And she told this story. That Hebrew slave that you brought to us to make sport of me, well, as soon uh, as I screamed for help, he left the house because he ran and, and he ran out. And his master heard the story and everything that went on and that his wife told him. And 
uh, said this, this is how your slave treated me and he burned with anger. Then Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. So here's Joseph in this moment of struggle. And, and can you absolutely imagine this? Joseph is doing the right thing. He's, he's in this trial, he's in this tribulation, and here's this moment uh, for, for falling and failing, and here's Potiphar's wife coming at Joseph, and, and Joseph simply says, no, it's not the right thing to do. I'm not going to do that. And yet in the moment of doing the right thing, bam, consequences happen. Horrible consequences. Joseph probably looked at God and said, God, what are you doing? And and I have felt some of these things in my own life, and I'm sure you have too, where you've followed God. And you've done the right thing. You've you've been reading the books. You've been coming to church or or, or trying to love Jesus. And and you're walking this journey, and wham, a struggle or a trial comes your way. And and you probably want to do what I want to do often. You throw your hands up and go, God, seriously? Seriously? seriously, I'm, I'm following you here. This is where I, I just bought a lottery ticket. I'm supposed to win that, not go through this trial and this struggle. What are you doing? And here's Joseph in the middle of this, looking around probably going, God, I remember the dream you gave me. Way back when, 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 I, when I was with you and walking with you and you said, I, I'm going to be somebody special and significant and I'm going to do really cool things for you. And now I'm in jail, a slave, falsely accused, and I can't do anything about it. I would call that a trial. I call that a struggle and a tribulation. And here is Joseph in the middle of that. And this is what makes Romans chapter 5 so powerful if you go back there. This is, uh, I think, something that Paul wrote and, and somewhere in the back of his mind he had to have Joseph's story there because this is what Paul says continuing this. Boast in your suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And that was right in Joseph's life as he'd gone through everything that he was going through. What God was developing in Joseph was perseverance. And what he does for us when we go through trials and struggles, what God does for us is he develops perseverance. And what is that? That is the ability to do the right thing even when it's difficult. I read a lot of books on leadership. I love leadership books. I love life skill books. And and every single one of them will, will tell you that the trait that means the difference between success and failure in life. If there's one trait, you know, humor and, and, uh, and happiness and, um, you know, extrovert, introvert. If there's one trait that means the difference between success in life and failure in life, success in relationship, failure in relationship, success, success in the job, failure in the job, it's perseverance. It's the ability to keep going, to do the right thing, even when everything around you is difficult. How many of us have seen broken people, and and you see those people, and and you hear their story, and and they unpack it with you. This was going on, and and you get to that moment in their story when they tell you, I just gave up. I couldn't do it anymore. I, I I couldn't keep walking forward in this relationship. I couldn't keep walking forward in this job, in this circumstance. I just couldn't do it. Well, what'd you do next? I, I just gave up. And in that, they lost perseverance. They, they lost the beginning of their strength. They, they lost the thing that leads to hope. They lost the thing that grows their faith. And what uh, the scripture is telling us is simply this, is when we lean into God in those dark moments, when we lean into God in our struggle, what he does for us is he develops perseverance. He gives us the ability and the strength to keep doing the right thing because it is near impossible on our own to have it. But he pours that into us and we gain this perseverance. And from a practical perspective, how do you do it? I'm in the middle of a struggle. I'm in the middle of the trial. How do I hold on, Jim? I don't even know how. Does God just show up and and he sprinkled just magic dust on me and I'm able to endure in this circumstance or this situation? For me, it's been this way. Here's what God has done for me. I find how I hold on when things are crazy all around me is that God gives me truths. And it's those truths that I hold on to. Some of the, the most important truths to me uh, in my struggles and my trials have been a few of these. And I'm just going to give you a, a, a couple here. Uh, one that's, that's really valued to me is found in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. 
I love this truth when I'm in a trial or a struggle, and it simply says this, know therefore that the Lord your God is God. Sometimes it's just nice to stop and go, God, yes, yes, you are still God, and you're in control, and he is a faithful God, and he keeps his covenants, or he keeps his promise of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. There are moments in the middle of a trial or a struggle when I just simply need to know that God is God and that he, he loves me and that he is going to keep his promises to me. The promises that he's made to walk with me, to, 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 to show me life and, and to develop me into who he's called me to be. And so I hang on to that promise. Another promise that, uh, that I have that, that I really enjoy, and this is a, a newer scripture for me, comes from Psalms 56 verse 8. I don't know if you know this about God, but uh, Psalms 56 verse 8 says this. Record my lament, record my sorrow, list my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Do you know that God keeps a record of your tears? You ever realize that? There are times in, in my life when, when I have been in the middle of a struggle or a trial, and all I simply need is to know that God sees me. That God recognizes me when we were in the middle of, uh, of the journey with, uh, with our, our firstborn. She was born seven weeks early. And, and week one and two, you're just surviving. But week three, four, and five, when it was one step forward and two steps back in the NICU. And we're in the middle of those moments. And, and, and I was standing there and I would literally cry out to God, God, do you see me? Do you see my pain? Do you, do you see what I'm going through? I just needed to know that God saw me. And then I have this verse in Psalms that simply says this, God not only sees you, but he's counting the tears that you cry. Collecting them, he knows you're hurt. And sometimes in a moment, what I need to persevere and to keep moving forward is to know that God sees me. And God sees you and he knows where you're at. He knows what you're walking through. And that may be a promise that you need to hold on to, uh, knowing that. Another good one that, that I've held on to is Isaiah 41, 13. And it, and it simply says this, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. It's so valuable to me to know at times that, that when I'm walking through a journey, I'm not walking alone, that God, just like a good father, reaches down and, and I reach up and I just grab hold of his hand and he simply says, I am walking with you. Whatever you face, whatever trial you're going through, that he hasn't forgotten his promises, he's there to hold our hand and walk us through. And that is so important in this journey of the Christian life because oftentimes it feels like God has broken his promises. That, that God is not keeping up his end of the bargain. For Joseph, uh, you know how long it was after God gave him the dream that he became who uh, God called him to be? 13 years. 13 years, Joseph went from slave to prisoner, just waiting it out, trying to figure out if God was going to come through. God did, but 13 years he had to walk hand in hand with God, and I'm sure at every moment turning and saying, God, is it time now? Are you going to deliver me now? And, and that's not the only one. You look at David. It was 20 years between God saying, David, I'm anointing you as king, and when David became king. And he had some great moments in there. There was the giant moment. Woo, that was awesome. But there were also the valley moments where Saul was looking for him to kill him. And for 20 years, God held David's hand and said, I've got something for you. Hang on. Don't give up persevere. And the stories go on. Abraham waited 25 years for a promise. God had said, I'm going to give you a son. And he and his daughter, or he and his wife, Sarah, they didn't have kids. And every day they would, they would wake up going, is today the day that this thing is going to happen? And for 25 years, they had to wait for Sarah to become pregnant, for God to deliver this promise. And, and they waited on God in those moments. Moses waited 40 years in the desert tending sheep before God used him. I say all that to say simply this. Second Peter talks about how God is not slack concerning his promises and a thousand years to God is like one day and one day like a thousand years. God is at work. And the thing that makes perseverance happen for us is knowing that truth. Wherever you are, whatever journey you're on with God, maybe this morning the thing you need to know is that God has not given up on you. 
He's walking with you, engaging you, holding you. And I'd simply say, don't give up on God. Don't give up on God and what he's doing in your life. Don't, don't turn loose of perseverance because here's the rest of the journey. We, we boast in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character. And character is that thing that, that we all love and all want because it's having a set of values and standards. These are the, the values and standards that God is giving me and I'm holding on to those. Some of them I'm wrestling with, but I'm, I'm holding on to these values and standards. But God is also giving us the courage to live them. So it's having the value and standards and the courage to live those values and standards. Hypocrisy comes in when we say, oh, this is who I am, but this is what we do. And what God is developing out in us through suffering and us leaning into him and through perseverance is having the kind of character that changes lives so that other people look at us and say they're authentic, they're real. What is the greatest thing that attracts people to God? Right, Jim must be great preaching, or it's incredible worship, or it's nice buildings. You know what attracts people to God? Authenticity. That we are real, not perfect, but that we are real in our journey with God, and we've taken the values he's given us, and we are with courage working to live those values out in our life. How do you get character when those moments of trials and struggles, you lean into God and you persevere until God brings that about in your heart and life. You have the character. Go back to Joseph. A unique thing in his story is this. His experiences could have broken him. His experiences could have shaded him and jaded him and shattered him. He was sold by people who cared about him. Uh, he was never vindicated. Do you know that wife never stepped up and said, hey, I lied about Joseph and the DNA samples came back and he's okay and they let him loose out of jail. You know, that never happened to Joseph. Joseph never went back to normal. There were some things about his reputation that he never recovered. And so he could have held that against God, all those kind of things, but he never did. He always leaned into God and in leaning into God, God did his deep work. God did the the thing in his life that, that produced this amazing character because there's coming a moment And this moment is coming for all of us. There's going to come a moment in Joseph's life when that character would be so important. A famine is coming. A famine is coming in his family that gave him up, that sold him. His family is going to be in crisis and the promise is going to be uh, kind of in trouble that God has given them that the whole world would be blessed by Abraham's family because most of them are about to die because of the famine. And God is going to raise Joseph up to a place where he's going to be the number two in Egypt. And as number two, he's giving out the food. He's the one saying yes, yes, no. No, yes. And so he's the guy doing that. And Joseph's family is going to show up. It's going to stand before Joseph. They're not going to recognize him. They're going to stand before Joseph and say, can you please give us food? And Joseph is going to have a moment when his character absolutely matters. God is going to place this whole thing on his shoulders. God's going to say, Joseph, you have walked through a tough journey in life. It could have made you bitter, but you've leaned into me. And now I'm giving you the ability to do something amazing, to save a life. And in that moment, Joseph, because of his character, is going to have to choose to do the right thing. He does. That's the story we're going to unpack next week. But that is the story for all of us. That God is is in our struggles, working out his truth deep in our heart and our life. And we're learning things about God and we're learning things about ourselves and we're persevering and, and we're developing character. And what God is doing with all of that is making us ready to minister to other people. I mean, it's really cool that God's working out character in us so that we can go, yeah, I'm a person of strong character. Woo, yeah, this is good. I love what God is doing here. But God is doing this stuff here so that you can minister to folks out there. You are going to meet people that don't know your God, that need hope, that, that need your story, that need to know that God shows up when things get tough, that need to know that God is real when, when, uh, when things are hard, that need to know that if you hang on, God does a deep work. And God is preparing you even now so that your story can change lives. I think the most valuable thing that we have as Christ followers is our story. The things that we offer to other people say, you know what, this is my journey, this is how I walked with God, and this is who he is to me and how he's come through. 
that's what God is developing in us and, and what he's giving us. And at the end of all of this, and, and I'll wrap with this, is simply this truth. Boast in your suffering because it produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. You are hope. God is hope in you, but you turn around and give that hope to others. You give it to family members. You give it to friends. You give it to people you walk with. You are a hope and a hope that does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You are the hope that God is using in this world. And the struggles that you find yourself, and and every single one of us have been there, some of you right now have a promise. You have a promise that you feel like was from God and you are not seeing it come to fruition. You have a a struggle or circumstance in life where you're going, Jim, this is is not good, this is not right, And, and you just are feeling exactly what I would feel, which is, God, where are you? Know this, God is right there with the truth, counting your tears, wanting to hold your hand, saying, hang with me. What I'm developing in you is so beautiful and God will use that to change another person's life. If you're willing, if you'll let him, if you'll lean in. It's a beautiful story of what God does in us and a scripture that I can't say that I totally enjoy, but I know the truth of it. God does deep work when we lean in in our trials and our suffering. I want to pray for us this morning and just give you a moment where you can honestly just talk to God. Seek his face. Maybe you're just simply saying, God, I need to know you're real now. I need to know who you are because I'm in this struggle. Maybe you want to pray with our elders and leaders in the back because you need encouragement. Let God encourage you in the journey and grab hold of perseverance and what he's calling us to in this life. Let's pray. Father, we're stepping into your presence now. We've, we've been hearing your word and, and this journey that Joseph went on and how you call us to rejoice, to boast in our sufferings, not because our sufferings are good, not because our trials are good, but because you do deep work there that you are doing deep work in the lives of so many people in this room because of the journey they're on, that that you can take this broken piece that we have, this, this thing that we're holding on to, and you can make it good. Father, we are your workmen who you are preparing good works for and good works through. And so God, give us hope this morning. Let us feel your hope that you are doing something. And for those of us that need your encouragement, pour your heart and your spirit and your life out. Show us your love and your grace and let us feel your presence and your spirit this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.